Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 169 of your favourite Formula 1 show. Yes, we return this weekend to discuss all of the action uh, from the Japanese Grand Prix. And we've got to be quick about it because apparently Jamie is getting raided by the police. <laughs> Classically, I happen to live in a city centre and there's always sirens going past. And uh, I might need one by the end of this because I, I'm on death's door this week. <laughs> I'm not making a fuss, I'm making a point <laughs> to quote Jeremy Clarkson. That you might be able to tell that I'm I can't really speak very well. So that that always bodes well for a podcast. Uh yes, yeah, so forgive me if there's a lot of sneezing and blowing my nose. I I, I would try and edit it all out, but we'll we'll wait and see uh, as to how we get on. But of course, yeah, if you aren't already, please do make sure you get yourself subscribed as well. We ticked over five hundred subs. Uh, inside the last week or so, Jamie. So a massive thank you uh, yeah. to everyone that is still providing us with support. We are currently on 512 subscribers, so we're almost caught up, Jamie. <laughs> we haven't done an update recently. We're 40 what, away. What we're 40 away. 40 away. It's, it's going to happen sooner rather than later, ladies and gents. Um, but yeah, moving though towards the Japanese Grand Prix, obviously for us, uh, European fans, it was it was still earlier than maybe many would have liked. Um, but once again, shout your hate towards Jamie in the comments uh, because you thought why you only had, me? Because you <laughs> thought you had better things to be doing this weekend. I actually got up for the race. Did you stay up? We're I not get to might have fallen asleep later <laughs> on, but it's fine. I saw all the important bits. I was uh, sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag at six a.m. on Sunday morning with a towel as a pillow and I woke up feeling like death not because of the stag do but I was at a stag do so there you go I caught a virus because of cold and inhaling bonfire smoke not I had about three shots worth of alcohol so leave me alone three what Jamie this is unheard of <laughs> unprecedented I, I went on a lad's holiday with you last year and I don't think you had three drops of alcohol in the near week we were there <laughs> this is incredible scenes <laughs> No wonder yeah, you don't got feel straight, well. Yeah, straight on the Pendel and whiskey. It was lovely. Nice. Are you still hungover, I bet, after your three shots two nights ago? <laughs> I, well, my nose is making me feel like I am. But Fair thankfully enough. not. I, d I don't quite get how your nose makes you feel hungover, but I guess we deal with hangovers slightly differently. Um, cloudy cloudy head. Mostly enough. from the Lemsip and the paracetamol. <laughs> we, we move. <laughs> Jamie might fall asleep halfway through, and it'll like, be incredible could viewing. Let's talk, though, obviously, before we got to Japan. Of course, we, we did a preview last week. We covered pretty much everything uh, that we kind of knew about at the time, didn't we? Whether Daniel Ricciardo was going to keep his seat. Um, whether, you know, a few other bits and pieces going on in the world of Formula 1. Uh, we, we did get some sad news coming into the weekend, didn't we, Jamie? Yuki Sonoda, bless him, uh, confirmed... Oh, I say sad, it was actually quite happy in the end. But he confirmed it, it was nice to go back to Japan in April. Because uh, he gets to see all the all the lovely trees... Uh, which which mm. he doesn't normally get to see. Yeah, Japanese cherry blossom is on point. It looked great, and some of the photos that came out from uh yeah the different teams. I know Haas released a really cool one where like they they shot through some cherry blossom branches at the track. Oh, it suits the color quality. of their car as well. It does. It does. Uh, so I'm happy. I'm as happy as Yuki Sonoda is, although it yes. doesn't sound like it. No, bless him. Um, and the other, the other big one, wasn't it? Was of course after so many people hurled abuse at Williams Formula One team, uh, it was confirmed that now, so for the whole timeline of events, ladies and gents, Alex Albon broke a chassis in Australia, got Logan Sargent's car. Many people thought that wasn't very fair. Um, it's now been confirmed that obviously they couldn't repair the chassis before, I believe. China. It might have been later than that, wasn't it? Actually, it might have been Miami or even when we returned to Europe. Williams don't quite know yet. They can't find it on the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, but now <laughs> it's been confirmed that now Logan Sargent has to deal with this broken chassis until they get a new one. <laughs> so he's stuck now with the broken chassis as Albon can write cars off and get away with it. We, we spoke about it all last week. I personally don't feel like my thoughts and feelings have changed on the matter at all. Um, no, not particularly. It's Formula One at the end of the day. It's a brutal sport, and unless you're doing better than your teammate, he's going to get preferential treatment. Unless, of course, exactly. your name is Lance Stroll. Exactly. And also, Sergeant didn't do himself any favours by crashing in practice. So no, he didn't. He did his best to write off another chassis uh, for Williams. He, he tried. But... He tried. 
yeah, thankfully for them, it was able to be fixed this time. So, or nothing was actually damaged at all. The chassis was fine. But Williams are going through parts like no tomorrow. For a team that isn't really near the budget cap, that's quite difficult. Yeah, they're, they're up near the budget cap nowadays. James Valls wants them to be able to spend Oh, yeah, he actually money. wants them to be spend more money, doesn't he? Yeah, but he even wants to so, spend facilities. repair damage for a team that is operationally pretty poor is not very helpful. Williams, I think the best thing to say are currently they're going through parts like they've gone on their Excel spreadsheet and are just holding delete and random <laughs> arrow keys. That's what they're yes. doing. Um, That's exactly what they're doing. But I mean, yeah, obviously free practice, of course. Japan's got a... I, I really like it. I mean, we, we both like it as a circuit. Yes, maybe I've gone on the record in saying I think Fuji deserves a shot at hosting the Japanese Grand Prix again. I will die on that hill. Um, but of course this place has something that Fuji doesn't have uh, and that is an absolute no room for error which we like on a Formula 1 track don't we Jamie yes totally because the drivers should be on the edge of like performance the whole time and when you're on the edge of the performance there should be a consequence for messing up whether that's a barrier in Monaco or grass and gravel here or yeah it's a shame when you go to places like, like Bahrain even or like uh i was gonna say cheddar for a second no definitely not um plays with these huge huge runoff areas where like you can just make a little mistake and it's absolutely fine it's a bit of a shame so yeah we saw logan Sargent get punished for it and we saw a number of other drivers making mistakes in practice uh going onto the grass and obviously that ruins a whole lap rather than just getting you know the time deleted you've got to wait a minute until you find out who's where no just stick grass on the edge of the track please Exactly, exactly. Formula One needs to, you know, gravel traps and grass are the key. Um, so I think we we both argue, wouldn't we, that this is very much kind of one of Formula One's best driver's circuits, isn't it? I think so, yeah, for sure. Uh, and that would explain why as soon as we moved <laughs> into Q1, Lance Stroll got knocked out. <laughs> yes, uh, not not the best look, especially as I think in Q1, wasn't Alonso second or fourth or something like that? I believe he was second in the end in Q1. Yeah, while Stroll is chilling in 16th and knocked out by, yeah, a bunch of people in F1.5. So, yeah, that was not, not the great look from Lance Stroll, uh, especially when Aston Martin brought in some upgrades. Uh, they had enough for both cars, but they wanted to, like, face off against each other. So they gave Stroll the new parts in practice one Alonso only got them in practice two so Alonso basically had an hour less time in the car and still dropped like almost a second near enough a second wasn't it in qualifying I mean to be fair it's it's always what we say with qualifying basically now follows a routine doesn't it Q1 and Q2 is obviously just the back marker five teams go out Unless, of course, Lance Stroll, which happens more often than not, bottles it. Uh, and that then means someone from those backmarker teams gets to make it into Q3. This, I, Jamie and I were talking about it pre-show. This, I think, is probably one of the quintessential problems that Formula 1 has at the moment with the amount of predictability. Even qualifying, which in previous years has often been sometimes the most exciting part of a Grand Prix weekend, even last year. That was the case on a lot of occasions because you had Ferrari that were able to match Max over one lap and that kind of thing. Uh, Now even that feels quite predictable for the most part, doesn't it? Yes, especially like the first 40 minutes, you could basically switch on for Q3 and kind of predict at least 9 of the 10 drivers that are going to be there. Uh, Apart from, well, unless Lewis Hamilton does a Melbourne again. So, yeah, yeah. it's, it's a bit of a shame, but... I, the problem is I do quite like watching both the fields battle within themselves, but it's a shame yeah. when one of them is battling for P10 or P11 at best. Yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of good, isn't it, that Lance Stroll kind of does a charity service in the idea that <laughs> if you do finish best of the rest, you're likely to get a point. Um, Unless which, you which Joe, are... where he got screwed over in Bahrain. But. Well, yeah, unless you show in Bahrain. Or, of course, last weekend where a fair few... Sorry, last race even, where a couple of them got a chance, obviously, with Max and Lewis having issues. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, out in Q1... And Russell. And Russell, yeah, forget about that. Uh, out in Q1, of course, Lance Stroll, as we said, Gasly, Magnussen, Sergeant and Joe Guan Yu. And this was another point that Jamie and I were talking about before the show. Joe Guan Yu, at the moment, is just... I mean, Bahrain was good. We said that at the time. Bahrain, he really delivered. Since then, 
He's pretty much, he's been on, it's been him and Sergeant on the back row of the grid every time, I believe. Pretty much, yeah. And I don't, yeah, I don't know what it is. I think he didn't have the updated nose that Bottas had. I think I need an updated nose, to be honest, this podcast. But uh, yeah, that was a shame for him. But I think he's got to pick it up quite soon. We obviously know what's going on with, with Audi coming to that team well, title sponsoring it next year and then coming in properly the year after. I believe so, it's title sponsoring two years. Ah, uh, there you I go. I think Steve no, have got no a two real. year deal. So, yes, they he has to pick it up. Otherwise, he's not going to be able to find a seat, I don't think, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but he was screwed over in a race because he didn't get a chance to do anything because the team is not helping him out with like reliability and slow pit stops and. Yeah, he's Are not had a me clean race. Sauber had another slow pit stop. It, to be fair, by their 2024 standards, it wasn't that slow. <laughs> so, <laughs> very low bar, but yeah. It is It is shocking, isn't it? I think what's more shocking, though, is again, a, a stat that I gave Jamie pre-show. Logan Sargent, so far in his F1 career, has never gone out in Q1 more than six times in a row which he's kind of let's be fair he's kind of the benchmark for a poor driver at the moment isn't he or a driver that is likely to be dropped soon yeah it should be lance stroll but there we are um <laughs> joe guan is currently on a seven streak of being knocked out in q1 mm. whereas bottas seems to reliably at the very least be on the precipice or making q2 i wonder whether there's been an element from Sauber, kick, stake, whatever we're calling them, basically going, look, it's a shootout between you two this year. And whether that's been Bottas has just decided he's going to actually try, whether that's been an element of Bottas maybe not sharing as much data anymore, at the end of the day, Joe is not delivering to the same level as Valtteri, is he? Which, of course, is difficult because Bottas, you know, people do like to absolutely poo on him. But he is, what, a nine or ten time Formula One Grand ten, Prix winner? I think it was. Indeed, and also he was an excellent qualifier at Mercedes. That he was, was fantastic. probably his, his strength. Yeah. Like he was only ever really three tenths on average, probably off Hamilton, who's I like would... one of the greatest qualifiers of all time. In yeah, his prime I would anyway. say their average probably across what five seasons together. I I haven't got the data for it, but I would assume it would be about two three tenths. It can't be much Which is more not a lot. than that. It wouldn't surprise me if it was even closer than that either. That's how good Bottas was over one lap. Had the racecraft of my grandmother, uh, but there we are. <laughs> that was always a yes. bit of a shame. Yeah, but Salva really aren't helping either driver out this year because their, their car is shocking, especially in quality pace. I think race pace is maybe slightly better than a few others, but yeah. It, it seems, doesn't it, with the back marker group that the qualifying pace seems to be further spread than the race pace between them all, yeah. doesn't it? They all kind of have their own strengths and weaknesses at the moment. Um, but yeah, moving into Q2, though, that one was a bit less surprising, wasn't it? Of course, we did have the, you know, the fight for who would make it into Q3. <laughs> but really, all weekend long, Yuki Tsunoda was a cut above the rest of that backmarker group, wasn't it? Um, yeah. But and to be fair, I think the RB is slightly better than the other four teams. The RB uh, definitely is the strongest qualifier out of that lot. And the strongest No racer, doubt about it. I would say. Uh, I think the advantage, again, is a lot less. It probably is still. But I think the I think Haas when they get it hooked up have got a chance. I think Williams when we go to a track that suit their car yeah. more should have a if good chance. If I had chance. to put all of them, it would definitely be RB, Haas, Williams. Wait, who am I forgetting? Alpine. Oh yeah, they're last probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Al, what was I say? RB Haas, Williams, Sauber, Alpine. It's probably the race pace order, anyway. I feel like Alpine have the most potential in that group, yeah, but I, I would well, probably they agree should, with you at the moment. Yeah, you'd hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that then meant, obviously, Ricardo. he did actually a pretty good job in qualified, didn't he? I saw way too many Australians saying that he's back, and they can't wait to see what he does on Sunday. That'll be discussed in a minute. Still lost to Sonoda in qualifying, but you know, he, he did wasn't still, embarrassed. But he was right there, so, wasn't he, this time? Yes. Yeah, indeed. So we got into Q3, and actually... It wasn't a whitewash by Max Verstappen. It Arguably was. it was, because he set two times good enough a pole. But I was very impressed that Perez was so close. I actually thought for a second Perez might have had him, but no. Uh, but 0 0.06, not bad at all. And uh, I wonder, yeah, that probably gave Perez a little confidence boost. And 
obviously he's fighting for a seat for staying at Red Bull next year. So that's probably a little confidence booster because he was obviously a bit further back in Melbourne than he would have liked. And uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see for the next few races. But if he can keep that up, I don't see why Red Bull wouldn't keep him. Do you want to know the maddest thing about that for Sergio Perez? <laughs> okay. Do you, do you know when his last front row grid start was? Was it like Italy or something? No. Was it? No. It wasn't Jamie. Baku. Uh, no, Miami last Miami, year. Miami when he got pole. Oh, Miami yeah. last year was the last time Sergio Perez started on the front row. It has nearly been an entire year where and his Max teammate has won, has won 23 basically of those races. Every race <laughs> apart from two in that time. I mean... Yeah, that Red Bull, don't get me wrong, is not as strong over qualifying as it is in a race. But, yeah, the fact... Perez, don't get me wrong, <laughs> in terms of just looking at this weekend, he did a fantastic job in qualifying. And as you said, he lost a bit of time in Sector 3 on his final run, because I was with you, I thought, he might actually do this. Um, but everyone seemed to be losing to Max in that final sector, so I don't know if he just had a bit more top-end speed or what was going on with the setups. Um, but yeah, Perez was super. Cl- I mean, to be within a tenth of Max Verstappen here is always pretty good. It yeah. Must also be said, though, generally speaking, not actually one of Max's best tracks, is it? It is in no. the advantage usually here has been less than it's been in a lot of other places. Albon, if I remember correctly, in yeah, nineteen right. tied him. He did, and Max only beat him on because he set the time first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he didn't race here for a couple of years, but then he's only had what Perez was his teammate in twenty two, two three, well, four. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I would have to look up what the times were then, but certainly twenty nineteen, he wasn't on it compared to Albon. Or maybe Albon was on it. Who knows? No, so he, he just I so I just don't think it's a tra- it doesn't suit Max's driving style. I think Suzuka no, uh, particularly because he's probably a bit too over the limit. <laughs> um, then again, I'm saying this, of course, he still bagged pole, and of course, as we know, he still won the race. Spoiler alert yeah. for anyone that he's didn't only, know that. He's only run 122 of the last 24. That's pretty poor going. Ex- exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but he, I, again, it just it says levels, doesn't it? The fact that the, the idea that it's not a Max Verstappen track when he still takes pole and wins, um, but yeah. it's just that his teammate is actually able to get a look in at him, I think is, is the point we're trying to make, yeah. or the point I'm trying to make before the Verstappen fans yeah. hate on me. Other thing from Q3, everyone was really, really tight between, what, third and ninth, really, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Third to seventh was split by a tenth of a second between, it was in the end, Norris, Sainz, Alonso, Piastri, and then the Mercedes and Leclerc were left, what, seventh, eighth, and ninth? Well, Leclerc only got one run. Yeah, which has obviously hampered him a bit, but it wasn't the magical Leclerc Q3 lap that we've been so used to seeing. And yeah, he was a tenth off signs, and that was four positions, which is pretty mad. Um, yeah, so yeah. It really, that battle in qualifying, especially, is very tight. But it, as we said a couple of minutes ago, in the way that the back marker group obviously kind of spread out in qualifying and kind of accordion back together in race yeah. pace, the front group seem to do the opposite, don't they? Everyone's right on each other over one lap, and then you and get then into it, a race and yeah. kind of the pace splits out a bit. It strings out, and everyone ends up where they should, apart from Alonso. But yeah, we'll, uh, exactly. we'll get into that. Exactly. Well, let's let's move on then into the Grand Prix, shall we? Um, obviously, we all got up nice and early, six in the morning, unless your name's Jamie, because he thinks he's better than the rest of us. Wow. Um, and <laughs> immediately after we hyped up Danny Rick for doing well in qualifying, I think he got away with this one far too leniently. Uh, he just took Alex Alvin out. S- yeah. Simple as in my eye. Yeah, straight up. Uh, just lack of awareness. Didn't know there was a car on his outside in turn three. And... Alban did his best to avoid it in the end, but couldn't. And it was completely Ricardo's fault, and both of them out. And they throw a lot of tyres around. So, red flag, straight away. Yeah. So, if you got up at nice and early, at, you know, five to six UK time, then it was another 20 minute wait before the race actually got going. I tell you what, as well, I'm going to have my Formula One was better back in the day rant. <laughs> no way should that have been a red flag either. It's mostly because of the barriers, wasn't it? But it was just tyres. Yeah, but then what else do you do? Because they're all over. Put the them back together under a safety car. Mm. I yeah, feel I F one has red flags that way too early. Is steered into this. Well, we can't have laps under a safety car because that's not entertaining. 
I, he does, <laughs> well, I, I, waiting I, I, I wouldn't even... Actually, to be fair, the best case scenario would be safety car laps... And then the safety car comes back in and they do another grid start. That's what I want to see. Oh, grid, second grid starts are so novelty, though, aren't they? I just, they it, are completely. But especially I, I when you have multiple red that. flags in one race, it proper annoys me. Yeah. yeah I think that was arguably, as an F1 purist, that's one of my least favourite rule changes in the recent years. Uh, they, I, I quite like it, to be fair. They, re- they basically realised after Italy, wasn't it, 2020? It's like, ah, oh, red flags make a race really exciting. Yeah. Let's just do it all the time. And then the race well, after in Mugello, you had three red flags. Yeah. It's like, what the heck is going on? It's it's a little bit odd, isn't it? Um, but yeah, going back to the Ricardo thing. Now, I can already see the comments saying, but he had Stroll on his inside. No, Stroll wasn't there anymore. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo just swung across Alex Albon, who had a lot of the car alongside. Absolutely deserved space. Uh, and if that was me, possibly could have been some penalty points on his license. Um, but he, he got away with it. I can understand why it was deemed a racing incident as well, to be fair. Yeah, it is lap um, one. But it was still, from a driver with that much experience, sloppy. And, fun fact, uh, Williams, they reckon they've damaged the chassis because of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not a good time to be James Vowles right now. But uh, they've got two weeks to fix it, so maybe they'll have a go. Not going to hold my breath. I reckon they'll have two slightly damaged chassis. Um, ready for Shanghai, but yeah, obviously, like we said, we got a red flag. That was about twenty minutes. I really did the nodding dog, trying to stay awake, uh, <laughs> but I, I did make it to the second start. Uh, and yeah, obviously, we had a. It was back to the normal grid order, wasn't it? They, they. No, it was taken. No, it was. One. It was taken because yeah. originally it wasn't, and then it was again. Yeah. Um, which meant that Jamie's favourite, Nico Hulkenberg, was going to start P10. Points possible, yeah. Jamie. There no. we go. It was all looking good. It was looking great until uh, until the lights went out and he got anti stall. I don't. I haven't looked if it was his fault or the team's fault yet. But it was whatever his. it probably was his. You don't often see anti stall caused by the car unless you Joe it hungry. Uh, yeah, that was also his. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Still not over that. That was a P five for the taking. <laughs> oh, not in the race. It wasn't. It no, might it have wasn't. been a couple of points. Yes, but it wasn't going to be that. Yeah. So the. The, that ruined everything. He went from, what, 10th to 17th or something like that. Basically, last of the drivers running. Um, also, making contact with the Alpines. But uh, Ocon was annoyed. Gasly got damaged. Uh, but they probably all hugged at the end of it. It's fine. Well, I think at the end of the day, it makes very little difference down at Alpine, doesn't it? Um, right yeah. now. But, uh, yeah, that was one of those ones. Was it? it was, I'm trying to remember this from being very It was Gasly coming time. down the middle. Ocon was yeah. on the outside. Ocon, it was another example in my mind of Ocon probably squeezing his teammate far more than he needed to. Mm, I think that's he... harsh. Uh, no, don't get, me wrong. don't get me wrong. I don't think he deserves a penalty or anything, but that was one of those ones where you're kind of like, you know, both of you at the moment, you're going to be picking up scraps. You've got about another foot, foot and a half on your outside there. Yeah. It's lab yeah, one. Just give him a bit of room, mate. Come on. Yeah, because Gazi had another car on his inside that exactly. was squeezing him too, so... Exactly. Don't get me yeah. wrong, never in a million years is that a penalty to Ocon or anything like that. But it's It's probably more to the fact that Ocon's got a reputation for doing this more than anything else. Yeah, I think. it won't help him. Exactly. Um, but then, of course, you know, after the highs of Australia and the unpredictability, uh, Red Bull came back and just drove off. And we never really saw them again, did we? Yeah, not, not massively. Uh, Max had his customary four or five second lead and Perez actually put a few seconds on the Ferraris too so well it was McLaren of Norris wasn't it at the beginning um so yeah that was that was it for you know unless there's any reliability then we're gonna see a one-two I still think Suzuka needs a second DRS zone down past 130R the, 130R DRS zone only Would for that the Brave happen? I don't know probably if that, we, not it'd be but funny I'm s- I'm staggered. I I could be wrong by saying this, but I'm staggered they didn't try it again with the really high downforce cars of 2017 through 20. It just feels like you're asking for a massive crash. Do you remember when they put it at Turn 1 at Silverstone at Abbey? One year? Yes. And then Marcus Ericsson almost like died in the race. He didn't almost. He span off. Yeah, he had a massive crash. Well, my, just my, like... I think my point with that is then, close your DRS when you're going through 130R. 
Like I, I, I what? But leave it, it an it, option for the drivers who are brave enough. Yeah, that's a terrible idea because they'd all leave it no. option. They'd, they'd all leave it open, and all of them would crash. <laughs> well, they wouldn't all crash, though, would they? Because if you see someone crash in front of you, you go, oh, actually, maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> maybe. I think I wonder actually whether with it something like that. No, because it used to be the way in 2011, wasn't it, when you could use DRS everywhere? It wasn't everywhere. I did wonder for a second whether it was a bit like the Monaco Tunnel. What, did we ever find out why you couldn't use DRS in the Monaco Tunnel? Just dangerous. It was high speed, and if you crash in the tunnel, it's an absolute nightmare to recover the cars. So Was that the only reason why? Pretty much, yeah, because they were just worried people were going to crash. It wasn't anything to do with air pressure or anything like that, no? No, I don't think so. No, because uh, I was going to say maybe it was similar, obviously, going over the bridge here, but of course I don't Because back in those days, in 2011, you'd have to break for 130 I wouldn't you, slightly? Or was it a slight lift? No, it was flat still, surely. I, don't, I remember the game. Was flat forever. I swear you couldn't use DRS at 130R in the game. Oh, probably maybe you couldn't use DRS, but it was a flat out corner. And same with O'Rouge, they wouldn't let you use it there. But Wait, which game are you on about? 2011? 20, 2011, 2012, yeah, when you could use the RS everywhere. Oh, no, you absolutely could still. You mm. absolutely could, you just wouldn't. We'll go that test was also it. Probably Matt, Matt will do some controller. research. Yeah, I will do. Yeah. I will do. If I was on a wheel, I'd have spun out, but controller's mm. got that extra traction. So. No, not on 2011, 2012. You needed the sense- <laughs> well, 2011, yeah, was a pad game, but you needed the sensitivity right. still. We need to get back wheel. on topic here. <laughs> we have very much gone on our end. Um, where were we? Where were um, we? Yeah, I think the the big saving grace for this Grand Prix, though, wasn't it, was the fact that the teams made it a bit interesting, not by on track battling necessarily, but just all the weird and wonderful strategies. Yeah, and that was a benefit of the red flag, I think, because obviously they do a million simulations of a fifty seven lap race. Suddenly you make it a fifty five lap race, and it's no one 53. really knows what's best. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. Take two laps off the end, uh, and everyone's kind of in the dark on strategy so people were trying different things you had the two mercedes and leclerc went long on uh on their first set of tires and yeah the red bulls and signs and others did sorry about to sneeze it's really bad take over Sainz obviously went a little bit shorter um with checo and lando kind of more obviously on the obvious two-stop strategy uh, the you know oh, sort of come. more orthodox, um, <laughs> but then we had a bizarre little moment, didn't we? Where five cars from Bottas backwards <laughs> all just decided to pit at exactly the same time. Yeah, I wonder if they all said like, I wonder like, do you think they said like follow him in? It was basically Bottas was training everyone after the, this was for stop number two. Bottas had undercut a bunch of cars and was running in a net P10 once everyone pitted. Uh, I think everyone was told yeah. to undercut the car in front. All at the same time. And All at the yeah. same time. So five cars pit and Bottas with a customary, what, five second pit stop off already from, from Sauber trying to be safe and not get cross threaded wheel nuts. Ended up going from 10th to 14th behind all of them, apart from one. So that was clever uh, and ruined his chance of points, which was a shame. As has ruined every chance of Bottas points so far this year, isn't it? through yes. i don't know apparently and i thought this wasn't true but apparently each team can develop their own wheel gun for obviously for their own yeah. thread and bearing i oh excuse me always thought that was homologated like because well, obviously the Freddy tires are because obviously the tires are homologated there must be some sort of joint between the tire and the rim that is well, it has to be, otherwise the rim would fall off. Yeah, exactly. So that must be the same. So at what point does it become independent? Like, does and a team why take would over? It be independent? Surely, why would a, it? surely a company could go around to every team going, we've developed this fantastic wheel locking system. It'll take you half a second to get a wheel off and back on. Everyone should just use it. Yeah. Cause it just, Have we I got our million dollar business idea? Who knows? We should or are we it. just wrong? We could just be wrong, but we should do it regardless. Fantastic. We'll get VIP hospitality to every single Grand Prix for forever. Yes. We'll do imagine that no wheel live at track every single weekend. Fantastic. Oh, Fantastic. We love it. We'll get the studio um, one day. We will. We'll we'll rent out the Sky Studio when they get with it <laughs> quite soon. Um yeah, Leclerc though obviously on his long strategy he managed to, he did get between the Red Bulls temporarily, didn't he? Uh, and then inevitably because Leclerc is either basically the second coming of I, you know, I don't know. Um, he's just—he's either—he's either fantastic or he's not. Is where I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, he then immediately bottled it, didn't he? 
yeah, he lost the position to Perez. Max was already gone, so only Perez got through at Degna 2, but that re-established Red Bulls 1-2 and they never looked back. So, yeah, uh, you, it was interesting to have this mix, but eventually uh, it played out. So it basically meant you had cars battling the whole time. But as we said before, it's a shame. The races are almost like slightly too long, maybe, because everyone by the end of it, I guess it's a Grand Prix, it's meant to like... It's tradition to have it be 300. Is it 300k? 200k? It's 300k's, yeah. There you go. Just uh, so I don't really want them to change it, but it's a shame that it practically always plays out the way you'd expect. You know, like if you play the football match for 10 hours, then the better team's always going to win. If you play it for 90 minutes, there's a chance that the worst team snags a result. Are you condoning sprint racing, Jamie? Am I condoning sprint racing? I actually, I'm probably backing sprint racing. And this is what I'm, sorry, that's yeah. what I meant even, yeah. Maybe I am. Maybe I've had too many drugs today. Because <laughs> yeah. that's basically what you're saying here. It is. What Sprint races need to be enough that everyone has to make a pit stop. Yeah, sprint, I want like 60% races. That would be quite interesting. Just Although again, it, it would steer into the idea, of course, that we know what's going on for Sunday. But it would be quite interesting, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, as you said, though, kind of by the end of the race, wasn't it? Everyone basically ended up pretty much where you would expect them to be. Leclerc was really hanging on towards the end, but of course that then fell apart. Um, Sainz then would get through, uh, and it would. It, it seems like Ver per Sai is now the new Hambot <laughs> Ver, isn't it? But yeah, fair play, slightly. Carlos Sainz. He's just you living know, his Sainz best life. Has had a podium in every race that he's entered. Yeah, madness. Every race that he's finished. I, well, would, I would I would assume he entered think? technically in Jeddah. Oh, I suppose so. Every race he had, uh, it was every race he before. started. Yeah. Yes, which yeah. is very good going considering last year's season he was definitely the number two Ferrari, other than a few races in the after the summer break, wasn't it? But yeah, he's doing yeah, a great job. The break, and it, yeah. a couple of good moves as well. Overtaking Norris was impressive, uh, and yeah, it was a shame for Lando because I think he's probably getting a bit done that McLaren is just a little step back from Ferrari so they're kind of in no man's land if they have a good race um, behind the Ferraris but ahead of the Astons and Mercedes or Alonso and the Mercedes sorry <laughs> um, yeah so that left us with a Repo 1-2 with Carlos Sainz on the podium for the third race out of four which is good going for him uh, Charles Leclerc the next up on the one stop uh, Lando Norris on two I do think McLaren probably were a bit passive on their strategy yeah, Norris. McLaren McLaren threw away an opportunity here, I feel. Or at least yeah. the potential of an opportunity, wasn't it? Yeah, they basically pit him early to cover something that wasn't really worth covering. Um, and then it was obviously not an ideal strategy. So that was a shame. Alonso did well, P6, ahead of both Mercedes and Oscar Piastri, who had a bit of a shocker, really, by his high standards for a driver well, again, of his youth. Yeah, he- he got a little bit screwed over by McLaren's passiveness, didn't he? And George Russell attempting scary things right towards the end. Although yeah. that wasn't actually what made him lose the place. No, because Russell didn't. He had to cut the chicane, but kept the place because Russell obviously forced him off. And that was... Well, uh, it was more yeah. the fact he kept his wheels alongside, wasn't it? Because cutting the chicane after you get forced off nowadays is I suppose, still yeah. a reason to give up the place. Well, the was definitely ahead. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Don't be wrong. I'm not saying it was. He should have had to give that up. And, the, and yeah, Russell did just one, barge him off. The one place. Well, Lewis Hamilton's P9 is. Pro- is it he finished ninth already this season once? Once or uh, twice. Uh, even? Seventh and eighth, I think, in the opening two. Was he not ninth in uh in Jeddah behind Berman? And it might have been seventh and ninth actually. Yeah. Not great. It was the worst ever start to his Formula One season. Hey, to be fair to him, he has overtaken Lance Stroll in the championship. So. Woo! That's pretty good. Uh, and then Yuki Snowder picking up that one point that was on offer because Stroll had an absolute shocker. Uh, actually did finish, but just finished P12. Uh, yes. Shout out to Snowder. He did a couple of great moves around the outside of turn six before Dunlop. Uh, one of them on Hulkenberg on awfully dead tyres on a one stop. But the other one on Williams, I think it was. I think it was Alban. No, he was out. It must have been Sergeant. Uh, yeah, quality stuff from Snowda. Um, and picking up that point and I think he will really be on his own in the championship by the end of the season just picking up these results he'll kind of be where Albon was last year yeah where he's king of the midfield and then everyone else is picking up scraps 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's... I mean, I'm going to say it. Sonoda was my driver of the day. Um, you know, really good, solid result all weekend. And, you know, yeah, there's a little bit of biasness, and obviously he scored points at home, but he scored points at home. And I think, you know, he was, again, kept everyone else kind of in that second group at arm's length back. Uh, and also meant that Stroll couldn't score any points either, which was hilarious, <laughs> the radio he made at the end. Yeah. Yeah, very, very good stuff. If you haven't heard it, I would recommend listening to Stroll crying to I, his engineer about how slow the car is when your teammate's I running in sixth. don't get... I've and, like, and of course, obviously, I get the Formula 1 drivers have different mentalities to you or I, but if I was Lance Stroll and I was delivering like this every week, I would really struggle to justify why my dad is spending this much money <laughs> for an F1 team. It's like, like, I, would, I would struggle yeah. my own moral compass. It's like, what do you think is going to change for you to win a world championship? Yeah, or a Grand like, Prix I don't for that know. matter. Yeah, yeah, who knows? But uh, yeah, I was just looking at the championship. Oli Behrman's still twelfth. Yeah, yeah, he, he'll, he'll end up beating like five of the back markers. Probably know will. To be honest, six points is going to be a tall order for the Alpines and the Salvas if it carries on like this. So yeah, we'll see. But uh, Snowden will probably be a comfortable P eleven, I would say, by the end of the season. Yeah, unless we get some big shocks somewhere. Or, again, Alpine finally work out how to build a Formula 1 car. Um, I've been trying for 10 years. Well, yeah. I, I said Yuki Snowda as my driver of the day. Who would you go with, James? I'll go Snowda as well. I'm, I'm feeling nice. Let's give it to him. And I believe uh, I got closer on our Lance Stroll predictions. Because I think I said P10, you said P9. Yeah, I think I was too generous this time. but uh, We were that's... both too generous. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can go for a little uh, P sixteen in my in uh in Shanghai. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, do we want to do race rating that kind of thing, or do you want to do the quiz? I believe you've brought a quiz this week. I have brought a quiz. Uh, speaking of Yuki Tsunoda, we'll go for him because the quiz is about Japanese Formula One drivers who have scored a Formula One World Championship point oh. or more than one. There are eight. Uh, okay. And you have you have a minute starting now. Takuma Sato, Yuki Tsunoda, Kamui Kobayashi, um, oh, uh, oh, what's his name? Aguri Suzuki. Yep. Um, Yamamoto no. never did. Never. Ide never did. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting an obvious one. Nakajima. Which? Both. There you go. There's two, <laughs> <laughs> two left and they quite hard. Yeah, they're both in the 60s, aren't they? One of them raced at like, the Dutch Grand Prix in 1963, I feel. Uh, like, I could testing, not tell you. His... I'm just seeing a list of names. So one of them raced in the 90s. They're both racing in the 90s. Oh. Oh, who am I thinking of? You've got five seconds. It wasn't a Nui or anyone like that. No. Um, can you give me their initials? I just really want to see if I can. Oh, can, you give, can you give me the years they raced in for like which teams? Uh, maybe you're quite good yeah. on the nineties, aren't you? I I quite uh, like the nineties. So one of them. Uh, this is a great. How this website is awful. <laughs> <laughs> 70 no 97 to 98 was one of them i can't tell which team because this website is horrendous 90s well i'm doing a career mode right yeah. that started in 98 oh uh i can literally see him what's his name though <laughs> He scored his points in 97. 98, he raced for Minardi all season. Yeah, I can see him. Can I well, remember his name, name, though? Uh, it's not Ricardo Rossit. Nope, he doesn't it's sound not, It's Shinji Nakano. There you go. That's annoying. I should have got... I didn't actually and know he scored points, to be fair. But that, oh, yeah, I should have got him. He raced for Prost in 97, got two points. Oh, dear me. And the other one got his points in 1994, oh. racing for Tyrrell. This might be quite hard. I've never heard of this guy, so fair play. I won't be able to get it, but I guarantee you I will have heard of him when you say it. He is called Ukio Katayama. 
Yes, Katayama, of course. Uh, of course, I yeah, know. I, yeah, I no, 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 to be fair, I, I do know him. I do know him. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I go. do. I, well I do recognise the name Katayama because he was Six out of not eight. particularly great. I'll take that seventy five percent. Um, race predictions, though, Jamie. What were the scores on the doors coming into this one? The scores were nine to you and twelve to me. That's an odd way of doing it, but you I, pulled uh, out points yes. this weekend. Uh, I went Max, Max, Lando, Leclerc, which netted me four points for Max Verstappen. Yeah, well done. Four uh, points for you, saying Max would get pole in the win. Yep, you said Max, Max, Perez, Piastri, which is go. gutting for you because, actually, no, you would have got this wrong anyway, to be fair. Um, but you tried to put Piastri strategically in. I did. Um, I, I really would thought... would get P3 behind Lando. I really thought it would be Lando P2, Piastri P3, like last year, but... But sadly not. But it paid off because I got more points. So you did, you did. That you open up your margin, and you're up to thirteen. Thirteen. So a five-point buffer. Wow, we race Wowie. rating. Uh... I feel like a bit of fraud because I didn't watch it. So I struggle to say whether it was better or worse than Melbourne. I think we gave Melbourne like six a and a half each. Six and a half each. I feel like because of this, I think this probably deserves to be the best race of the season so far. But it probably still doesn't deserve particularly high praise. I'm going to say for that reason then it's a seven. I'll go six and a half. But I didn't watch You it, reckon so it was no that. better than Melbourne? I quite enjoyed getting up from Melbourne. I, obviously, I've only seen the seven minute highlights of this one, so it's quite hard to tell. Fair um, enough. Yeah. Fair there enough. There you go. Uh, and our last little piece of news, which is pretty hot off the press, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about a lot more next week. South Korea. It looks like they're going to be getting a Grand Prix next year, which is pretty mental. At uh, Youngham. Not next year. Oh. Sorry. Um, it looks. Well, they've sorry. They've sent a. I jumped the gun there completely. They've sent a yeah, letter of intent done? to the FIA for a Grand Prix for 2025 or 2026 on a five-year deal. It's not Youngham coming back. That's um, a shame. Which eh, yeah, maybe a bit of a shame. Um, but I, th- I believe it's it's gonna be another street circuit probably. It'll be Seoul Street campaign. Circuit, won't it? Probably. It would be quite cool, but maybe not. Well, we don't know much yet still. Um, but it was just one that we saw very quickly before we dived on. Uh, is there anything else to add though, Jamie? I think we've done everything. I think we've done everything. Wonderful. Thank you all as always so much for listening. If you have enjoyed, please do make sure to leave a like, get yourself subscribed, uh, and yeah, Jamie and I will be back then next week. Ready to preview Formula 1's return to Shanghai. Yes, a lot of new fans don't know this, but we used to race in China.